Hello, everyone. So welcome back. How, how many people were here yesterday? Just show of hands. Ah, OK, everybody is here yesterday. So I can't tell the same story about my leg. So I'll give you an extension of that story about my leg. So let me give you the extension. So the extension was, um, you know, after the, the main anesthesiologist did the, uh, did the spinal uh, on me, I think she put in a lot, because I think she didn't want me to feel any pain. So anyway, when I went into recovery, uh, my legs were quite numb. So the nurses kept checking with me because they want to kick you out, right? So they kept checking and they said, can you feel your legs? No. Can you feel your legs? No. So after about the third hour that I couldn't feel my legs, I got a little worried. And so I'm half you know, asleep. You're kind of doped up with all the junk that they gave you. So I thought I'd check my leg. And for those of you that have an epidural or a spinal before, you know, for the ladies that have delivered, you realize that when you're anesthetized, your leg feels huge. It's like a tree trunk, OK? It feels so abnormal. And being half comatose and being a man, I thought if my leg was this big, <laughs> so clearly it wasn't helpful, OK? So. God is so unfair. Anyway, so no, no more about my legs. Okay, no more about my ankle anyways. Um, so today what we're going to do is, if you don't mind, and I, and I apologize for inflicting this on you, I'm going to do that quick summary that we skipped over last night because everybody was exhausted. And there are some people that weren't here yesterday. So let me just review what we did yesterday, and then I'll introduce Dr. Paul, and then we'll get on with today's agenda. So we have a little bit of buffer time here. So I'm going to speak very fast. Don't worry. You didn't, you're not going to miss anything. So in the health promotion section, Mike, Mike Demansky coming up from the US um, said a couple of interesting things. One, what, does, uh, what do people die from? So what kills people? So atherothrombosis, cancer, infection, and aging. And as an eight-year-old child, what he has, uh, basically the lifetime risk is that the atherothrombosis will kill more people than all wars put together, starting from that eight-year-old child forward. Uh, and that we can probably treat them at the later stages, like what we do now when they come in with acute coronary syndrome and put in a stent or, or aggressively attack them with TPA and things like that. But the thought is, can we treat them earlier and earlier and prevent the disease from occurring? And he said LDL is kind of like fuel to the fire of a plaque. And so the thought is, can we lower LDL, therefore decrease disease? And the earlier treatment may be helpful because people with that PCSK9 gene, that defect where they actually can't break down their LDL receptors, Therefore, their LDL levels are, are lower, uh, actually have less cardiovascular events. So if genetically you have a lower LDL from the beginning, you over your lifetime have less cardiovascular disease. So that's why he's thinking if we treated people earlier with a statin, maybe we could do the same thing artificially. And that's what the ECAD study is, which is the elimination of coronary artery disease, kind of a tall order. 15,000 people of the younger folks, 35 to 50 ballpark range, uh, treated with statins is the study that he's designing right now for us here in Toronto and Ontario. So it will be run uh, controlled from up here. And so we will need help from you guys. So if you're interested, please email Shannis uh, with the, uh, your email address. And then when the protocol is ready, we will send it out to you. There is one requirement. You do need an EMR that decreases your workload. And we'll have our own site inspectors coming uh, to check out uh, uh, in terms of pulling out patients and that for you. So it's actually a low work kind of study. So if you're interested in the ECAD, uh, please let us know. Vicky LeBlanc then talked all about stress and cardiovascular health. We all know that there is a connection, but she told us that traditional risk factors do not explain all of the um, risk in terms of cardiovascular events. Job stress, for example, two to four times increased cardiovascular death. So we're all messed up. Uh, bereavement, uh, two, to, two to three uh, times increase in cardiovascular death in that first month. And if there's a natural disaster like an earthquake, there's a six-fold increase in terms of sudden death within the first little week or, or two uh, there. So there is a linkage. The mechanism, one is possibly endocrine. So the um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is turned on, so you have more cortisol. Cortisol will cause you to increase sugar, free fatty acids, increase your blood pressure and cardiac output because your body thinks that you need to run. So in other words, stressfully, you need to go run, and that's why all of those things are up. So acutely, it's a great mechanism. Chronically, it's no good because now you have hypertension, uh, insulin resistance, and possibly uh, glycemic indexes uh, in issues, as well as atherosclerosis. Uh, neurologically, your sympathetic tone is also increased acutely that's a good mechanism, but chronically having a high sympathetic tone may not be good for you, and your heart rate variability changes, so therefore there's another way that stress causes problems. And then there's stress reactivity she talked about. There's hot responders, so they're more physical, 
<clears throat> in terms of the response, whereas there's the ruminators, which kind of mull over things and they don't let things go. They're the ones that have a grudge and their sympathetic tone is actually increased for a long period of time. That increases their risk of disease. And then how we cope, whether you're a problem-oriented solving person or whether you're an emotional solving person or avoidant problem uh, solving person, you have different changes in your physiology and it turns out the emotional and avoidant behavior or those types of people still have very high cortisol levels and high sympathetic tone. Therefore, they have increased cardiovascular events. So therefore, even though they might say they feel fine, if you measure them and they still have high levels, they're still in trouble. Dr. O then said about physical activity. Did you notice we put breakfast on the second floor now? So you actually have to walk up and down a little bit. And that's why the washrooms are located in such unusual places as well. Anyway, so but what, what he did was he said Interheart, basically, which was an MI study all around the world with 50-something countries, said that 90% of cardiovascular risk is governed by nine risk factors, and you know them well. Cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, those are the four that we know. Obesity, inactivity, and psychological stress are the three extra ones. And then fruits and vegetables and alcohol have a protective effect. So those nine things will govern 90% of your cardiovascular risk. Physical activity is a risk factor that is correctable, he said, and it's, a, it's dose dependent. So if you get more than 300 minutes, you have 50% decrease in cardiovascular risk of death. And then angiographically, over 300 minutes, you get regression. So there is a point at which you need to get above per week uh, in order to have that effect. The types of activity, any activity is good, he said, but aerobic activity is better. <clears throat> then he talked about VO2 max. That's how your body handles oxygen. So how much can it maximally process in terms of oxygen, therefore giving mitochondria energy and so on and so forth. And so basically our patients usually have 35% less than their, what a normal person with the VO2 max is. That's why they feel tired. And when you correct that, in other words, exercise them, they feel better and there's less dead. So that's a good thing. And you're actually training your mitochondria. Um, the activity actually re predicts, so the low activity level predicts risk and then correcting it reverses that risk. So therefore, it's a risk factor that we should ask about. You don't have to do a VO2 max. Just ask them how much exercise they do. That'll give you a good idea. <clears throat> and for my own point, there's three types of exercise. One is stretching, one is aerobic activity, and the third is resistance. And you need all three. So if you have somebody that says, I just lift weights, that's not good enough. They actually have to balance themselves in all three. Dr. Bradley then talked about sleep apnea. And what was interesting about this, he was bringing us the latest research of beliefs of sleep apnea. And originally, we just thought you're fat, and that's why you have sleep apnea. What he's telling us is that whole wine bottle. When I saw the wine bottle, I got very excited about his lecture. I thought it was something different. But anyway, so basically, the wine bottle is that as we're sitting inactive, we collect fluid in our legs. And then when we lie down, that fluid now redistributes back up. Unfortunately, it is in the venous system, so therefore, it goes into your neck, and it swells up your neck. And because there's bony structures and things like that, it swells inward, therefore constricting your airway passages. And so he showed lovely data that looked at that. Uh, and then he said that that would be obstructive sleep apnea. But then what about central sleep apnea where people just don't breathe? He explained that as well. In some people, the fluid is in your neck and fluid is distributing into your lungs. In, fluid in your lungs irritates your lungs, so you start to breathe faster, so you hyperventilate. And when you hyperventilate, you blow off all your CO2. If you blow off all your CO2, there's no signal to breathe because CO2 is a driving force for breathing. And so therefore, you'll have central apnea as well. So therefore, this fluid collection in those two locations, your neck and in your lungs, will explain most of the apneas. Because of that understanding, there are other options to treat. So for example, stockings during the day will decrease the fluid collection in your legs. Therefore, you have less fluid movement, okay? So we've been telling the patients the wrong thing, you know, elevate your legs. So we've been giving them sleep apnea. So I think they should sleep like this, like a V. So you collect everything in your butt, okay? <laughs> so that'll be very good. And then what we had is we had a beautiful session with the cardiovascular surgeons, which they got to show off all their neat stuff, and we think that they should have a video game of some sort. Um, so first off, we started off with venous disease, and we talked about varicose veins, and you guys know this very well. Risk factors is pressure, so standing too long, obesity, or pregnancy. Genetics, if both your parents have varicose veins, your chance of having it is 90%. So there is a genetic component in terms of your valves and in terms of your vein structure, I guess. Uh, hormones, females, it, uh, the female estrogen actually relaxes the vein, so that increases it as well. Or any injuries to your valves or blood clots will also increase your risk of uh, re, um, varicose veins. And then he talked about Dopplers and he talked about duplexes to look at the deep venous system to make sure that you're not affecting that talked about the Trendelenburg test where you can actually see where the valves are damaged. And then the treatment is stockings elevation. Here's the elevation again. Uh, endovenous laser or radio frequency is also there, but it's not covered, but it's a nice option for some patients, especially if they're obese and they can't take the actual open surgery. 
Uh, open surgery requires a cut in the groin, and then you saw that horrible picture where they stripped out the vein, and 40% have a recurrence in five years, so patients need to be aware of that. Then he talked about chronic venous insufficiency. Those are those ugly legs where it looks like its skin is like elephant skin, and he talked about venous eczema and ulcerations, uh, and that we need to check arterial circulation as well to make sure that they can actually supply blood down there and ask about deep vein thrombosis in the past. Most of these things heal with compression dressings over a, four, uh, over a 12 week period, 70% will heal. If they're not healing, consider a biopsy because it may be cancerous uh, there as well. And if you have superficial veins, superficial veins that are uh, the problem, surgery does help to correct that. Deep vein problems, the surgery obviously won't correct that. Then he talked about thrombophilbitis, which is inflammation and thrombosis together. And the, the treatment there is heparin and NSAIDs uh, and anticoagulation. Surgery is also useful for those patients as well. And if you notice that that thing is spreading towards the groin, then that becomes an emergency uh, visit to our friendly vascular surgeon. Dr. Oriopoulos went through four cases with us. And this was interesting. We don't usually see these patients. The first one was splenic aneurysm, and he told us that it's four to one in terms of women. And if it is more than two centimeters, then you need to be corrected. And then he showed us how you can actually put in micro coils. And that was the whole idea of that, that case to show us different strategies to reach the aneurysm. In this case, it was percutaneous instead of going through um, arterial side. The next case was about claudication. And then he explained about this surgery concept. So there's two things that they're deciding. Should I do an open operation or an endovascular through the artery operation? And where am I getting the inflow and where is the outflow going to? So where am I getting the source of blood and where am I perfusing? Uh, and then in, uh, the third case was right carotid an an aneurysms. And basically there he said, if you have one aneurysm somewhere, you have a 25% chance of having an aneurysm somewhere else. So in other words, in this case, it was on both sides. Uh, aortic occlusion, no pulses, and uh, neuro uh, neurologic deficit, deficit. And in that case, he was talking about a hybrid technique, so an open operation as well as an endovascular. So because at the, at the UHN and the Peter and Monk Cardiac Center, everybody's working together, they have all the options. So radiology, cardiology, as well as vascular surgeons are working together. Then Jeff talked about eight different cases, and I'm just gonna run through what he talked about in terms of key learning. The first case was about high-risk patients that can't have surgery. That's when they do the endovascular process. And then he said stents, and basically 80% uh, are uh, patent, uh, patent still in five years. Uh, superficial femoral artery, the stents don't do well because your knee is moving back and forth, and so therefore they tend to break and plug up. And what's interesting there, they're now putting that coated stuff on there, on the balloon, that uh, chemotherapeutic agent, they press it against the cells, so therefore the cells um, do not uh, grow, and therefore you don't have restenosis. Um, Self-expanding stents, he showed us that these, these stents that kind of pop open like an umbrella, and then there were multiple stents. You could deploy one stent and another stent, and you can connect it up. It's kind of like Lego, kind of neat. And then there was thrombolysis, which is that catheter that has all these little holes that sprays out TPA, so you can actually break up the clot as you move forward. And the stents can be covered or uncovered. So covered stents can actually help you stop bleeding areas. So if you have something that's torn, you might be able to fix that. Uh, and then finally, there was the CO2 uh, where you couldn't use the uh, dye, and so therefore they used CO2 bubbles um, to actually see where the artery is. And then finally, Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Tan showed us some crazy uh, thoracal abdominal aneurysm repairs. These are very sick people, and, and the first thing they told us was that your spinal cord is at risk when you're dealing with the aneurysm there because of all the perforating arteries, uh, and two-thirds of your motor is actually sitting in the front of your spinal column, so therefore paralysis is a risk. Uh, that we take with this renal function. If you have bad renal function, you have bad outcome, just like everywhere else. Uh, and so generally, they like to stop ACE, ARBs, and uh, decrease their calcium channel blockers, so they maintain the blood pressure. And they also talked about how you can actually tap off the CSF fluid. And by tapping off the CSF fluid, you have less pressure, so it's easier to perfuse. And then basically showed this beautiful video of how you can put in these crazy looking stents um, that are custom made with all the little branches and how you can actually deploy those branches away. And then he finished up by talking about aortic uh, dissection. The thought is that there should, could be rupture. It could actually occlude other arteries as the dissection moves further south or north. Uh, and that you have stents that can cover leaks and uncovered stents that can actually hold open your arteries. And that if they do have these uh, stents placed in for aneurysms and things like that, they need to be monitored for life because they can actually leak uh, over time. So that's what you guys did yesterday. And today, the session is gonna be even more packed because we have three more sessions uh, to go through. So I apologize for the long-winded summary, but basically, uh, we thought that that would catch everybody up to speed. 
And what I'd like to do is introduce Dr. Paul. And Narendra, I don't know, he's a low profile guy, but really this whole meeting was his, uh, his sort of emphasis and, and, and pushing forward. The heavy lifting was done you know, about five years ago when he said we need to connect people. The UHN is doing great work at the Peter Munka Center. We need to tell people about it. So the first year was just to show people all the wonderful things that were being done. And as the, every year went by and we got feedback, basically we said, you know, you guys said we want to hear about innovation, but we want to also want to hear about normal management of things. And so he's been very good at getting all the departments working together uh, and coming up with these agendas that you see here. So that's why those green forms are so important because Narinder sits tonight um, reading those things. That's what he usually does after he gets a collection of these green things. Um, so he's from the Department of Radiology. He's the head, and I'll give you his fancy title. He's the Chief of Cardiothoracic Imaging at the UHN as well as the University of Toronto. But I think um, uh, he goes much beyond that because he's very much about everybody working together. Um, so on that note, please, uh, Narinder, come and say a few words to our audience. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And uh, I, I feel so much better about what I do when he says it like that. It's great, isn't it? It makes me feel like it's, uh, I do something worthwhile. But I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for, for, for attending, uh, not only today and yesterday, but, but for those of you who come uh, time after time. And I do want to emphasize what Peter said. Uh, we do look at these forms uh, very, very carefully. We do take on board your comments. And I'd like you to say all of the comments you make go back to the Peter Monk executive. And just to emphasize that. So the executive is chaired by Barry Rubin, the head of cardiology, Gary Newton, uh, head of vascular surgery, who's the acting head is Tom Lindsay at the moment, the head of cardiac surgery, Viv Rao, the head of cardiovascular pathology, Jagdish Bhutani, uh, Pat Murphy, who's an uh, anesthetic re uh, representative, myself for medical imaging, uh, representatives of Allied Health and our administration. So we devote a, devote a whole session you know, uh, to this when we get the feedback to look at how things we need to respond to, uh, things that we can do short term, intermediate term, and long term. And some of those comments are centered on the symposium, the sort of topics that you'd like to see, and we, take, and, and, you know, we do adjust the symposium for that. And some of those comments are about how you'd like services developed or some things that you think work really well and by the way, it's really nice to have the compliments about things that work really well, you know, on a 7 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. But we also pay attention to things that um, we, we would like to do differently or we'd like to do better. Um, you will hear today, and you've heard yesterday, about the innovations at the Peter Monk Center, and those are very, very important to us. I'd also like to emphasize we also do the uh, routine stuff. And the routine stuff we do, whether it be echocardiography, whether it be CT, whether it be bypass graphs, whether it be peripheral intervention, we hold to at least the same standard of performance as the innovation stuff we do. Um, and we've also seen from your comments that there are things, as I say, we do very well, but that sometimes you find us a complex organization uh, to, to sort of get into. So the things that Barry leads are the stuff that we've promised and we have a process to deliver, and the stuff that we're mapping out. So for example, for this year, we're going to be mapping out the process by which uh, someone who may or may not be familiar with the Peter Monk Cardiac Center gets a consultation. And it's a complex process. We're going to be looking at how we can streamline that and make it more user-friendly. The things that we've uh, talked about in the past, we've been ma mentioning about cardiac CT for a little while. Last year, we announced a pilot study uh, with some of you. And the results of that have convinced us that this is time now to bring this to the fore. So what I'd like to say is um, each of you will have a form on your desk, and there's some more outside on cardiac CT. Uh, we've been performing cardiac CT since 2005. We do about 2,000 cases uh, a year. We've done over 10,000 cases. And as I mentioned last year, uh, we've decided initially just to keep it within the cardiology community because the most important thing is it's easy to do a test, but you have to look at where that test sits in patient management. And the last thing we wanted to do was make a test available when you might be sat with a patient who has a test which nobody knows what to do with, okay? So over the last six years, the cardiologists in the community have got very experienced with handling cardiac CT data. And the experience is of 85% of the patients that you might send to cardiac CT, they'll come back with a normal or minimal disease uh, result, and the treatment is straightforward. But maybe 5 to 10% will come out 
with something that's maybe that's intermediate. And so the question is that you would then refer to a cardiologist. Well, we didn't want to put the service in place if those cardiologists didn't have the experience to do something with that. I think we're at the point now that the cardiologists that deal with these patients know exactly what to do. So um, it gives me great pleasure to say that we are making cardiac CT available for uh, family docs. We think it's going to be a very useful tool. One of the talks today is about cardiac CT. And um, if you guys are interested in having this form sent to you in PDF or Word document, just put a comment on your form. Or in fact, if you have the form, just leave your email or fax number, and we will get it sent out to you. Um, as I say, Sebastian's going to talk about that. The other thing that we talked about last year was uh, having increased communication uh, with, with those of you in the family practice who'd be interested in talking with us. And the pilot data suggests to us that this is a very useful uh, process. But we're also aware that each of us are really, really busy in our work life. So how, how, do we, how do we make it more accessible to you? So what we're trialing today is at lunchtime, there's going to be designated tables uh, at, at lunch with uh, a different person of PMCC's name. So there'll be a Barry Rubin uh, table, a Viv Rao table, a uh, Peter Seidlin table maybe. I'm going to be at a table. If you've got specific things you want to discuss in an informal manner, uh, I would welcome you to go to those tables and sit and talk to the folk that are at those tables. And so, you know, have, have a sort of a informal conversation because sometimes it doesn't really come to your mind at the time. Um, equally, if you want to sit at a table and don't want to talk to anybody, that's fine too. Right? This is just an opportunity to uh, this is just an opportunity for us to try to get some feedback. And if you if you find that's useful, please let us know because then then it encourages us to do more of the same. If you find it intrusive, also let us know, and then we'll readjust things. So, um, I do <coughs> I do want to thank the faculty who give all their time voluntarily to be here. Uh, I want to thank Shanaz and the uh, girls in admin who enable this to run. I want to thank each and every one of you for your participation and, and helping us to make this better. And I also want to thank our sponsors. Uh, very important. that We've got some very strong connections in the industry. They, they believe in this process, and they've been very strong supporters. So AstraZeneca have been with us for some time. Uh, we have the Tinamark March Group, and BMO have joined us this year. Um, I think they're rattling off a, there's an iPad or something, right? But I think you have to put your name or something, and I think that's going to be done at lunchtime. So be sure you do visit them. And of course, we've got Lily Abbott, Boringer, Medtronic, and Servier. So I'd like to thank our sponsors, and please do visit them. They're nice people. Uh, they won't try to sell you a mortgage or anything. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Barry. Gary Newton sends his apologies. He couldn't make it this morning. So as Barry can do everything and knows everything, he's offered to uh, take over the uh, morning session for us. There is one change in the program I'm going to tell you about. Uh, the talk just before lunch is going to move after lunch. That's on cardiac CT. Dr. Crean, who was going to talk about case-based studies, has graciously allowed us to substitute his talk with the renal denervation talk. So as Barry mentioned yesterday, we do like to keep you abreast of things. And the renal denervation has really hit the media in a big way. And this is a good opportunity for Dr. Rajan, on behalf of the team that did this case, to come and talk to you just before lunch about what happened and where he thinks this is going. And, um, and he will also be at a table at lunchtime if you, if you want to talk to him about this. So without further ado, I'll uh, introduce Barry. Thank you very much. Thanks, Narinder. So we're really lucky to have Peter here to uh, moderate these sessions and function as our host. And uh, that was really an incredible summary. I don't know how you put all of that together on such short notice. So thank you for that. And uh, to Narinder, it, it really is true. This is, uh, you could call this the Narinder Paul meeting, or you could call this the PMCC symposium. It's kind of the same. Uh, he's the driving force behind this. So we greatly appreciate your ongoing efforts for this. Thank you, Narinder. Uh, one of the comments that Narinder made really struck me. Um, you know, we tend to talk a lot about the really innovative stuff that we do, but uh, the way we view this is like a pyramid. Uh, the top part of the pyramid is the innovation, like the cardiac stem cell therapy that you'll hear about today, or the renal denervation therapy. But the truth is that 90% of what we do is bread and butter stuff. Uh, PCIs of coronary lesions, endovascular repair of aortic aneurysms, aortic coronary bypass surgery. We strive to be excellent in those areas and to bring forward um, areas that are truly innovative and will 
uh, change the future of care delivery. Uh, I'd also like to point out one of the big reasons for having this meeting is to have engagement with you. So when you fill out those forms, as Narendra said, we really take them seriously. Uh, we want to understand how we can do better, how we can better serve uh, the primary care ph physicians that are gracious enough to send us patients. And we're also trying to have more engagement with you. And the uh, opportunity to directly send patients for CT angiography without going through uh, necessarily a cardiologist, and the opportunity to participate in the ECAD trial where we'll be looking to you to supply patients to work with us to see if we can eliminate or at least minimize coronary disease by treating people early on with um, uh, uh, LDL lowering agents is a fantastic opportunity for us to collaborate. So uh, I think we have a great session this morning. You're going to hear about the full spectrum of management of uh, coronary artery disease from medical management to uh, percutaneous coronary interventions to coronary bypass surgery. Uh, our first speaker is Len Schwartz. Um, perhaps has, uh, nobody has more experience than Len in managing the coronary circulation. Uh, professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto, and look forward to your talk on medical management of coronary artery disease. Len? Thank you, Barry. Uh, actually, I have two important talks today. Uh, this one and uh, my son is getting married. <laughs> at, at last. <laughs> we were beginning to lose hope. Uh, and the engagement party is tonight. So I have to give a speech at that engagement party. So if I start thanking you as in-laws <laughs> for taking my son to uh, marry your beautiful daughter, you'll know I got a bit mixed up. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think the title is very good. When, when is medical therapy the correct treatment for pe people with coronary disease or the right strategy? Now to move along very... Do I press a button? The green? Yeah, just press the green. The green loop? Okay. Yes, that's great. And um, so I think medical treatment is, is a very nice option, and it's kind of warm and fuzzy and uh, has generally low risk. But the, mo the most important thing is to be sure that you're not medically treating from the beginning or ongoing a patient who has what we call critical coronary artery disease, life-threatening disease that would be better managed by uh, a other, a, an, another option. So this is my definition, I think a universal definition now of critical coronary disease. Uh, it's disease where an intervention, either angioplasty or bypass surgery, uh, improve survival irregardless of symptoms. So you have a patient with minimal or no symptoms, and they have the, this kind of anatomy, uh, they should have a revascularization procedure if possible. So one, master, one, one must be sure when you see your patient initially, and you're the, often the first pe person who sees them, that you're not dealing with this, uh, these type of syndromes and continuing medical treatment, which would be a mistake, at least without, a limit, without ruling these out. The question is, how do you screen for critical coronary disease? Now, one would like, uh, one would hope, uh, that symptoms alone would be enough, that a patient who has a severe angina will have severe anatomy and, and uh, life-threatening anatomy, and a person who has very mild or no angina would have would not have critical life-threatening anatomy. It's not the case. We all see patients who have little or no symptoms, and when they have an angiogram, they have a critical lesion uh, that you wouldn't think existed based on their symptoms. On the other hand, you can have people with absolutely disabling angina and either no coronary disease or a lesion in a small branch vessel that is troubling them greatly but has no prognostic significance. So the question is, what, um, what screening tests can we do to try to determine whether our patient sitting opposite of us in our office has mild disease or critical disease? So I've, 
I believe that standard exercise ECG testing is very useful. Uh, when I started at the Toronto General Hospital many, many years ago, uh, Doug Weigel asked me to be in charge of the exercise ECG lab. I was very taken back. I was young. Sounded like a very important position. I subsequently found out that we didn't have an exercise ECG lab. Uh, we didn't even have an exercise machine. All we had was a two-step masters. And we didn't even have a three-channel ECG machine. You know, you take it for granted, but the first, I was here when the first three-channel ECG machine arrived and I ran around and showed the tracings. Everyone was very, very impressed. And uh, that was on the old G West. I see John Spears is here today and we'll remember that's where cardiology began, at, really began at Toronto General. Anyway, I've always had a bias to simple exercise testing. It's uh, very, uh, uh, it's, it's safe, it, it gives a lot of information at a low price, and you can do it yourself. And I've always said it's not to send the pa your patient to an exercise lab, but go with them and be there when they're having it done. You can learn a lot from just watching their response to exercise. So I'm going to present a case where um, this was particularly useful, uh, a recent case. Interesting man, he's 73 years old. Um, he uh, had done some exercise in the past, but it stopped because of orthopedic problems. The orthopedic problems were taken care of. He, his life dream was to go to South America and climb the highest mountain, 23,000 feet. Somewhere in South America, I think it was in Argentina, and that was really his chief complaint. Now, that wasn't a complaint that came to me. He, he wanted to get, I think, his, uh, his passport signed by his family doctor, who happens to be my family doctor as well. Family doctor said, I'm not going to sign anything until you at least have some sort of screening that you're all right to do this because you haven't been doing anything. He sent him to one of my colleagues who saw him and ordered a stress test, and I happened to be in our clinic area when, the, when he had his stress test. So the technician brought it to me and I spoke to him. So that was his chief complaint. And he was leaving like in mid-January of this year. He actually volunteered no symptoms, had a fairly low risk profile, was a bit of a therapeutic, therapeutic nihilist. He didn't want to take any medication. Uh, but when you really pressed him, and this is typical of people with angina, he, he did have angina. He had a, vague precordial feeling, uh, sensation when he was doing his training, uh, but denied it, t tended to, to deny it. Um, anyway, what do you do? So his resting ECG, which is actually useless if you're trying to rule out coronary disease, people with, with the most severe coronary disease can have totally normal resting ECGs uh, if they've never had an infarction, for example. Uh, so his ECG was normal, so he we went ahead and did a stress test. And even in the first stage, you can see there's some ST depressions in the inferior leads. They're not remarkable, but they're there, and they're significant. This is the first stage of the Bruce. But by the second stage, he had severe ST depressions diffusely. This, to me, means critical disease uh, until proven otherwise. Uh, he couldn't believe it. I put him on a beta blocker just for some angina control. We did an angiogram very shortly after. I don't know if you can appreciate it, but there is a tight lesion. Is this a marker? Well, whatever. It's a tight, <laughs> it's a tight lesion at the, at the distal left main. Can everyone see that? And then further down is a lesion in the LED. So this is a, uh, the most serious lesion one can have. If he continued, I, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have made it home from South America. Uh, so he had bypass surgery he, uh, a week later, seen him in my office next week, repeat the stress test. As far as I know, he's doing well. So these are the um, what I call the ominous stress test responses. That's one, a stage one positive, has a 90% chance of left main or three vessel disease. Deep ST depression is not quite as specific, but still quite helpful. And if a person gets hypotensive when they're doing the stress test, if they don't have aortic stenosis or heart failure, it's a bad sign, often means quite critical disease. So any of these responses, I think regardless of symptoms, 
should prompt an angiogram. Now this is the 180 degrees, a totally different uh, scenario. Uh, another patient I've seen recently, 62 years old, his complaint was, Doc, when are you finally going to do a coronary angiogram on me? Because I had been following him for four or five years and not done one, which was unusual for me. Uh, anyway, he had um, classical angina. It occurred at the beginning of exercise and then went away. It's a second called the second wind phenomenon. So if you have a patient who gets discomfort when they begin, and then even, even if they keep going or slow down and then carry on, and they can do more later on than they could at the beginning, that's a classical second wind phenomenon. It occurs in claudication. It occurs, occurs in angina. It's also almost pathognomonic of, uh, of coronary disease. So there was no question from that history that he had it. And he had risk factors that were there. He had a positive family history, no diabetes, but he was a very conscientious person regarding his health. He exercised a lot. His lipids were all right. His blood pressure was all right. So from a risk factor profile, he was OK. So I did a stress test on him, and he went 10 minutes. No ECG changes of ischemia. He could have gone longer. His blood pressure increased appropriately. No arrhythmia, no symptoms. Uh, so a very favorable stress test. I th he has coronary disease. It's just in a silent area, sometimes circumflex lesions. Diagonal lesions can be there and not picked up on the stress test as ST depressions. So what I did is, and I had done seen him before, I compared that stress test with previous stress tests, and they were pretty well identical. So there was no reason, in my mind, to proceed. Uh, a stress test like this has a very low likelihood of critical uh, disease, particularly if it's stable. The problem with doing an angiogram on this patient who doesn't really need it. So once you do the angiogram, you see the lesion. And once you see the lesion, there's a syndrome called the oculostenotic reflex. The oculostenotic reflex is when you see the lesion, you got to do something about it. And then, the, and then, of course, the patient is awake, and they'll say, can I look at it while they're on the table? And what are you going to say? And they see it, and they say, we're not going to do anything today, doc? You're not going to open it up while well, you're in trouble. So the, and they've done, they've done studies showing that if people, the cardiologists, didn't know the angiogram, they could make very rational decisions on, on proper care following guidelines. But if they saw the angiogram, they couldn't. So I think the point is don't do the angiogram unless you're really sure it's necessary and you're going to do something with it. So there was no indication. So the fourth truism is beware of courage. Uh, you may have heard of courage. It was a large study done about four or five years ago uh, comparing angioplasty uh, versus an optimal medical treatment with optical, optimal medical treatment alone. And it's gotten a lot of press, and people, I think, have misinterpreted it, saying that, therefore, patients don't need to have an, an angioplasty or bypass surgery. Medical treatment is fine. And I think that's the danger. It did really have an impact on angioplasty volume everywhere. But anyway, there were 2,000 patients. Now, you have to realize that these 2,000 patients required a screening of 35,000 patients to get these 2,000 patients. They are very well screened, and there's a lot of uh, pre-selection that goes into interpretation of this particular study. Um, but when they compared the optimal medical treatment with PCI versus optimal medical treatment alone, there was no difference in primary event rate at 4.6 years. So the conclusion in the New England Journal of Medicine paper was as an initial management strategy in patients with stable coronary disease, PCI did not reduce the risk of death, myocardial infarction, or other major cardiovascular events when added to multiple, optimal medical treatment. That, that is a, a fair conclusion. Uh, the problem is that it may uh, not apply to your patient because every patient in Courage had an angiogram done. So anyone with critical disease was immediately eliminated. Anyone who didn't have a, a lesion suitable for angioplasty was eliminated, plus a lot of uh, pre-selection bias that could have been introduced. So I, I would be wary of reaching this conclusion without 
being sure that your patient doesn't have critical disease. I think the bottom line is they still need a stress test or some way of eliminating critical disease, maybe even angiography if necessary. Now, the fifth truism is pretty self-evident that medical treatment is always important. Uh, our patients go for angioplasty, they go for surgery. It doesn't mean the medical treatment ends. The medical treatment begins before their intervention, it continues through their intervention, and it continues afterwards. So all these things are important for bypass patency, for preventing restenosis if there's an angioplasty done, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and this was alluded to yesterday. Now, we all learned this in medical school that angina is due to an imbalance of myocardial oxygen supply and demand. Actually, there's no medical really good way to increase coronary flow. Nitrates really don't do it. Um, some new drugs that indicate that maybe in the microcirculation, there's improvement in flow or metabolism. But generally, what you're trying to do with medical treatment is decrease demand. And I must say that the pharmacology of angina has been very poor. Uh, there are three drugs. There have been three drugs for 25 years, three classes of drugs, beta blockers, nitrates, and calcium channel blockers. There's nothing new in Canada, and there are a few things in the States. There's Renexa, for example, which has also been impossible to get into Canada and may have added some benefit but wasn't profitable for any pharmaceutical company to take on. But there's very little, and all you can do really now is kind of make the right decision and try to work with the drugs you have. There is Laplace's law, which again we took in medical school, which deals with the myocard the tension in the myocardium. And it relates to or how the oxygen demands are controlled by how hot, fast the heart rate is, so the frequency of systolic generation. The magnitude of systolic generation, that's the blood pressure, contract and, and, and involves contractility and systolic blood pressure, the radius of the left ventricle, and wall thickness. Wall thickness actually works in favor of lower oxygen demand. So if you take a balloon and you blow a balloon up, then, and you look at the tension in the wall of the balloon, then it will increase as, you're, as you put more uh, stronger pressure into the balloon, as it expands, the tension increases. So as your left ventricle expands, the myocardial oxygen requirements increase. As blood pressure increases, demand or demand increases. But if the balloon is thicker, actually the tension goes down. So it, it is one benefit, actually, of myocardial hypertrophy. The problem is myocardial hypertrophy also decreases diastolic function, which is a detrimental effect. It also can outlast or outdistance the blood supply, which is detrimental. So it's not all positive. So in, as far as the pharmacological or medical treatment, you want to um, decrease heart rate and blood pressure. And there have been studies done in people who are unfit or overweight, and when they go on a treadmill, their heart rate increases precipitously, therefore more myocardial oxygen demand, and their blood pressure increases precipitously. And these are both bad things, and they're within treatment, uh, within a possibility of treatment. So you should tell your patient definitely to lose weight, and the recommendations from yesterday to do your 300 minutes of walking a day, of, well, not a day, a, a week, <laughs> They would be good too. You wouldn't do anything else, but anyway, 300 minutes a week, and you're and it's likely that angina will improve. So conditioning is important. Beta blockers are still one of the mainstays. Uh, ischemia control. One of the problems is p patients get too bradycardic and too hypotensive. So I tend to actually stop their ACE or ARB if they are, because ACE and ARB don't really do much for angina. Uh, but you may have to use another drug like Pindolol, which has ISA activity and heart rate can be controlled, or a pacemaker, which is all right, so you can use them. Calcium channel blockers and combination of calcium channel blockers and nitrates and people who you think may have coronary spasm. Beta blockers are bad for coronary spasm. So if you think there's an element of spasm, it's better to use combination calcium channel blockers plus nitrates and not use beta blockers. Stop the beta blockers. 
and then decreased contractility with beta blockers and decreased LV uh, radius. I've gotten a lot of mileage of really aggressive treatment of heart failure in people with angina. They may have um, very subtle heart failure, and you can do a BNP and see whether they are in heart failure, treat them more aggressively with, with diuretics, decrease their LV size, and they get an improvement in their angina. And this is my final world uh, word. I don't know whether you, anyone heard of Oliver Wendell Holmes, anybody? Uh, good, okay. It's one of my, uh, great, he's a great, great quotes from Oliver Wendell Holmes. There were two Oliver Wendell Holmes. There's the doctor who lived almost the entire 19th century and his son, who was a very famous lawyer. And uh, this is one of his quotes. It's an equally good quote for angioplasters and surgeons, but I couldn't find it. But this one is, I liked, uh, about medical treatment. Throw out a few specifics which our art did not discover and I firmly believe that if the whole materia medica, that's all pharmacology, as now used in 1860 and probably now to a degree, could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Len.